Good evening. Good. Hi, my name is David Joyce, and uh, as I like to say, I have the great honor and pleasure of serving as president of this very fine institution. And on behalf of the NAACP and Brevard College, I'd like to welcome you to our, to our, our gathering this evening. Um, it's a very personal and uh, privilege of mine to be able to introduce uh, a good friend who have rekindled our relationship. We were in school together many, 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 many years ago. <laughs> And uh, while we graduated together, we hung out together for three years, our, our paths just didn't cross. And we both have ended up in God's country. Mike, uh, Michael Bishop Curry, unfortunately, is almost God's country because he's down in the flatlands, but uh, eventually he'll, he finds his way up here to our beautiful mountains. Um, it, is, it is a pleasure, but I didn't even know this until I was reading about him on Wikipedia. Bishop Curry, Michael Curry, is the first African-American bishop to lead a southern diocese of the Episcopal Church. He served in three parish ministries, and he was active, and as you could tell while he was in divinity school, in ecumenicism and social justice. He founded ecumenical summer day camps for children. He created a number of network, so family daycare providers and educational centers, and he brokered millions of dollars in investment in inner city neighborhoods. During his time as Bishop of the Diocese of North Carolina, Bishop Curry refocused the Diocese on the Episcopal Church Millennium Development Goals, through which a $400,000 campaign to buy malaria nets probably saved at least 100,000 lives. Throughout his ministry, Curry has also been active in issues of social justice, speaking out, boldly speaking out, which you'll get to see in a moment, on immigration policy and marriage equality. Bishop Curry was born in Chicago, Illinois, on March 13, 1953, so as we were teasing each other, he, he is really much older than me by almost three months. <laughs> Bishop Curry attended public schools in Buffalo, New York, and graduated with high honors from Hobart College in Geneva, New York, in 1975. He received a Master of Divinity, school, a Master of Divinity from Yale Divin University Divinity School in 1978, along with a bunch of other ne'er-do-wells. Um, it, is, it has been amazing to, to see how small the world is and to be able to come together. I have to say, from knowing Michael for 37 years, um, actually we've known each other for 40 years because we started, yeah, 40 years, I hate to say that, but it's true. It's amazing, and we were just teasing one another, we haven't seen each other in a number of years, um, how little he has changed. One could see in him his fire, his passion, his commitment. His, his, his love of, of his Lord and our Lord and Savior, his, um, his, his intellect. Um, we were in a number of classes together, and I always hated when Michael was one of our classes. I knew, oh crap, there goes the curve. Um, <laughs> so it, it, it really is, and, and I'm not surprised he's wearing the purple shirt. Um, I'm, I'm really not surprised. You could see he was destined for greatness from the moment that uh, you first met him. And what makes him the greatest in my own mind, and again, what, what reinforces um, this, this 40 year relationship that we're rekindling, is his humility, his true sense of, of, of humbleness. Um, he's, it comes out, and, and out of his every pore. To do so much, to accomplish so much, to mean so much to so many, but to yet to still have the spirit of humility and, uh, and, and just caring for those around him is amazing to see, and I, and I personally appreciate that for being here. Thank you for doing that. So with that, please welcome the Right Reverend Bishop Michael Kirk. Now I have to say that um, the president, oh my God, I get to say that. President Judge, my love. I knew him when. And there are so many stories that I can tell. <laughs> but he might reciprocate, and I wouldn't want to give him that chance. Uh, I, as, as, as David said, uh, we, we knew each other 40 years ago. And um, what is fascinating to reconnect now with him um, here um, as president of this. Um, Remarkable, uh, remarkable college. Um, I, I looked at the statement about this school and what it stands for. And, and having David here as president 
and doing this together with the local chapter of the NAACP um, is rather remarkable. And it, the values of David Joyce have not changed. Um, a passion and a commitment to help the world look something more like God's dream and less like our nightmare. He had that passion and commitment 40 years ago. And to see it blossom. Our brother, it's so good to see you. And any friends of David are friends of mine. <laughs> now let me tell you something about Carter Harry, who also had something to do with this. That sister is something. And, and anybody who knows her or who has read her books over the years uh, knows that uh, this is a, prophet's for God, a prophet for God's dream. And I have known and respected her before she knew who I was. And, and when she called, well, when Carter calls or texts or emails, you basically answer. <laughs> and whatever she asks, you basically, you might as well say yes up front because you're going to say yes eventually. So you might as well just <laughs> cut to the chase and to be with her and David and, and the members of the chapter of the NAACP here in community and those who are part of this college community, um, students and faculty and friends. Um, it is a real privilege, and so I thank you. I thank you so much. Well, I don't mean, now this is not a sermon, so I'll, I'll, I'll refrain from that, but, but I did look at the Brevard, I looked at a statement that probably is from the mission statement or from a document that said Brevard College is committed to an experiential liberal arts education that encourages personal growth and inspires artistic, intellectual, and social action. I don't know how many colleges have a statement like that. I wish more did. I wish more did. We are in the midst of profound transformations as a culture, as a country, as a state. The world is changing in some transformational ways that are yet to be discovered and understood by us who are living through them. But all change is not forward movement. Just because something changes, if you look closely at it, it may well not be change at all. We are living through a time when the General Assembly of the State of North Carolina has consistently, in the last several years, passed legislation that oftentimes has been cruel, oftentimes is inhumane, and oftentimes does not befit the great state of North Carolina. And I do not speak in a partisan manner. This is not a Republican or a Democratic statement. I do speak in a humanitarian way. I speak as one who is a follower of Jesus of Nazareth, who tries to live out his teachings, the spirit of his life. But I speak as a human being, as someone who really does believe, like you sitting in this auditorium right now, that the nightmare that often is the case is not the way God intended it. There is a dream. There is a vision. There is a hope for something better. For something far more noble. For something beautiful. And that, I believe, is God's dream. That is our hope. That is in the sermon. It's really not. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> but I, I do am mindful of, of the fact that today, April 24th, um, is the, um, the anniversary um, of remembering the genocide of Armenians. And I was coming through some articles about that and came across a quote by that philosopher, 
Kim Kardashian. <laughs> but, but as you know, Kim Kardashian, her, uh, her father is Armenian, so she is of Armenian heritage and was recently there, um, and she and others of Armenian heritage have tried to give rise to publicity, to, to uh, an awareness of, of this horror. But she said something um, a few years ago ref in reference to this that I thought significant. And I'd like to lift that up and link it to something Dr. King said years ago. Kim Kardashian, I know, it's, I can't believe, now you know this in the sermon. I mean, <laughs> my text this morning is from the book of Kardashian. <laughs> anyway, Kim Kardashian said, she said, it happened before Rwanda and Darfur and the Holocaust. There was Armenia. And maybe none of those other genocides would have happened if more nations had condemned and responded to the Armenian genocide when 1.5 million Armenians were massacred. Next to those words, I would offer these. Dr. King said in his book, Where Do We Go From Here? We shall either learn to live together as brothers and sisters, or we will perish together as fools. The choice is ours, chaos or community. I want to speak for a little while on the subject, the human race is not good enough. The human race is not good enough. It occurs to me, and I think I'm on solid ground, that if you look deeply at the religious traditions of the world, I'm most familiar with Christianity and to a lesser extent Judaism and to a lesser extent Islam, but the Abrahamic faiths. But I think it is true uh, in the world religions, if you will, that there is a consistent pattern and drive at their depth and at their best. Religion, like anything else, can be perverted and distorted and has been. Human beings get hold of anything, they can twist it up. Um, but, but at our best, um, and at the deepest levels, the religious traditions of the world have consistently moved in the direction of trying to move human beings to a sense and an awareness of being part of something larger than themselves, which has been variously named and described, but something more than simply ourselves. I would say it as a follower of Jesus this way, but there are other ways to say it. That, that the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, I'm convinced the whole reason for Jesus, he came into this world to show us how to be reconciled with the very ground of our being, the very God who is the source of every one of us, how to be reconciled with that God and therefore, how to be reconciled with each other as children of that God who is the source of us all. He, he came to show us, if you will, how to be more than merely individual collections of self-interest. He came to show us how to become a human community. I want to suggest that our religious traditions at their very best point in precisely that direction, the way of reconciliation with God, the way of reconciliation with each other. I want to suggest that, that the human race is not good enough, that our religious faiths at their best show us how to be more than merely the human race. They show us how to become what Dr. King called the beloved community. They show us how to become what I would call a human family of God. And in that is hope for the planet and hope for us all. Let, let me unpack that a little bit. And, and don't be, please don't be offended by what I'm about to say, but I'm going to go ahead and say it anyway. 
being a member of the human race is not that much of an accomplishment. <laughs> I mean, it's, not, it's a good thing. I mean, I, 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 was I, mean, I like being a human being, but it's not an accomplishment. I don't believe it in doctorates and being a human being. Um, and, and, and I remember uh, reading, uh, what is that thing, Kafka, his met Kafka's Metamorphosis, where the dude, like, you know, went to sleep, woke up, I think he was a cockroach or something, and he woke up. Um, so, I mean, I, I would not like to wake up tomorrow and be a cockroach. I'm happy to be a human being, so don't misunderstand what I'm saying. But being a human being is not an accomplishment. I mean, it's just, you didn't do anything. You just showed up. <laughs> and, and, and the truth is, I, being a member of the, a human being is really, is basic biology, and that's important. That's a place of departure, but it's not the end game. Um, it's basic biology, and if I remember my uh, biology, at least high school biology, if I remember it correctly, um, human beings are living things, and uh, we are part of, we are mammals, which is part of the animal world, and mammals, if I remember correctly, have several characteristics, but among them are three that stand out. Uh, respiration, consumption, and reproduction. We breathe, we eat, and we make more of our own time. Now, my wife and I have two cats. They can do that. Well, actually, they've been to the vet. They can do two out of three. <laughs> If you will, you see what I mean? Uh, breathing and eating and making more of our own kind is not the high point of human life and existence. Um, and the truth is, uh, that, that's, that's not enough. We were made for more than simply the consumption of oxygen. That is not enough. We were made more for more than, than simply existing. Existence is not the same as life. That's not enough. No, our religious traditions at their best show us how to be more than merely the human race because the truth of the matter is the human race is what's killing us. The human race is about survival of the fittest. Oh, I'm getting to it now. The human race is about getting what I need to get for me and it's all about me and the heck with you. The human race is dog eat dog. It is the survival of the fittest and if the survival of the fittest becomes the way, we will not no, no, no. The human race. Am I making some sense this morning? Not this morning today. The human race is not good enough. And, and, and in my tradition, Jesus of Nazareth said it this way. Didn't, Jesus said, is not life more than clothing? Your body more than clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, the bird of the air. Are you not of more value than even those priceless creatures of God? No, we were put here to do more than consume oxygen. More than to consume things. More than to acquire. More than to climb mountains, we will put here to transform this earth from the nightmare it is into the dream that God intends. That's, right. That's what we will put here for. That is the high calling. No, the human race is not good enough. And it occurred to me that our religious traditions have been pointing us in this direction. The problem is we keep looking at our traditions. Well, this way, you know the um, there's a. I've heard it as a West African proverb. I've also heard it as a Buddhist proverb. I don't know where it comes from, which means people have been saying this proverb. Everybody all over the world take credit for it. But, <laughs> but the way the proverb goes, whether it's from the Cameroon in, in West Africa or whether it's a Buddhist one, I don't know. It's true either way. The proverb says, with the finger of my hand, I pointed to the moon, but you only saw my finger and never saw the moon. Our religious traditions at their best are fingers pointing to the moon. Pointing to the God who created us. Pointing to the way of universal brother and sisterhood. Pointing to a new heaven and a new earth. Pointing. But we mess it up by turning the moon into a finger. And that's not good enough. It, it occurred to me recently, not long ago, I went on, um, several years ago, I went on sabbatical and had an opportunity. I wanted to study the Sermon on the Mount, and I hadn't had a chance to do that in all the years, and so um, I decided I was going to spend time and do that, and so I decided I was going to spend, and specifically Matthew 5, 6, and 7, Matthew's version of the Sermon on the Mount, and I wanted to study that and look at it, and so 
you know, and you are serving on the mount, blessed are the poor in spirit, the poor, the merciful, blessed are the peacemakers, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteous, that God's righteous justice might prevail, blessed are those who are persecuted, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, pray for those who disciple you, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. That's in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7. Interesting, um, and Confucianism says it this way, do not, do not do to others what you would not like yourself done to. <laughs> Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? In Buddhism, hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. Sounds familiar. Islam, none of you has faith until he loves his brother or his neighbor the way he loves himself. And Judaism, where Jesus learned it, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow man. This is the entire law. All else is commentary. And Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, in everything that you do to others, do as you would have them do unto you. For this is the law and the prophets. I've heard that golden rule all my life. It didn't occur to me until I got older that this is in the religious traditions of the world. And I wanted to study the Sermon on the Mount, where that passage comes from in the Christian tradition. And so I, I decided that I was going to study the Sermon on the Mount, and then it dawned on me that I couldn't isolate it. Um, just kind of, you can't just rip you know, passage, the text out, Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And I needed to kind of look at Matthew, because I learned in, in seminary, uh, uh, Dave and I learned this together, that you can never uh, read a passage of scripture or anything isolated from its immediate context and its broader context, whatever that happens to be. I learned that in American Lit in spite of myself in college, and I took the course in American Lit, not because I was um, really that interested in American literature, but I was interested in a girl who was interested in American literature. So by default, I actually learned something. I remember the professor talking about the importance of context, both the literary context and the context of the writer, of the author, um, and the world in which that author would live. So I knew I needed, I was going to study Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, 5, 6, and 7, where Matthew has brought together several of the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth, that I needed to take a look at Matthew, Matthew's Gospel. Well, when I did that, I ran into something I had not anticipated or expected. I ran into a realization that in Matthew's Gospel, there seems to be a thesis about Jesus of Nazareth that Matthew is working with. That Matthew somehow came to the conclusion that Jesus of Nazareth, and these are my words, not his, but I think it's what Matthew's talking about, came to show us how to be more than merely the human race, an individual collection of self-interest, but rather came to show folk not how to get in church, not how to become Episcopalians, or Methodists, or Baptist, or Presbyterian, or even Christian necessarily. Lord have mercy, don't say the Bishop of North Carolina. Say Jesus didn't come to be Christian. Well, poor Desmond Tudor got in so much trouble by writing a book called God is Not a Christian. And folk disagreed. I said, well, what Bible have you been reading? <laughs> if I was God, I don't think I'd want to be a Christian either, but that's another picture. <laughs> Tape. Is this but, uh, all right. <laughs> but the truth is uh, that Matthew saw in the teachings of Jesus, in the spirit of Jesus, he saw a thesis that, that he came to show us how to become more than simply the human race, but came to show us how to become that beloved community, the human family of God. That's what the finger of his teachings, that's what the finger of his life, that's what the finger of the scriptures are pointing to, to God's vision and dream of humanity, not as a collection of self-interest, but as the human family, the beloved community of God. And that is a game changer. I could go through how Matthew works that out, but, but let me just tease you just a little bit and then move on. If you look at Matthew's gospel, Matthew begins by giving a genealogy of Jesus of Nazareth. And you, the tip-offs there in the genealogy. He, he, he begins uh, by saying the genealogy of Jesus, son of David, son of Abraham. And if you go back and, and, and look up Abraham, and, and where Abraham first appears, Abram and Sarai, his wife, where they first appear, Genesis 12, 
and ask yourself, why did, why, because remember, these genealogies are not biological statements. These, these, these are theological statements. They're not talking about um, what somebody's genetic background was. They're talking about what the genetics of their, back, their life <coughs> was, what it meant, what difference it makes, what it's all about. And so when Matthew constructs this genealogy, he's trying to tell you who this Jesus is and what he means. Matthew takes the genealogy of Jesus back to Abraham. Well, I looked up Abraham in the Jewish scriptures, Genesis 12. The Lord called Abram and his wife Sarai, who had both retired and were living in a retirement community in the Tigris Euphrates Valley. <laughs> they were doing well and enjoying life with their grandchildren, and, and things were going well. And the Lord called and said, I want you to, I want you to leave your homeland that you know. I want you to leave all your kinfolk. I want you to leave all the people and everything that you know. And I want you to go to a land that is not your own, to a people who are not your own. And those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, I will curse. And then he says, for through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. It is not an accident that Judaism is the mother and the grandmother of Christianity and Islam. Where true religion is, there's a blessing. Where false religion is, there's a curse. It's that simple. A blessing. To bless all the families of the earth. Not just some of them. All of them. And, and, and this is the introduction to Jesus of Nazareth. And then if you look down in the genealogy, it gets even more. As you look down, um, you see four people in there who are not supposed to be there. It's a first century Palestinian ge uh, genealogy. It was supposed to trace your ancestry through the patriarchal line. Through the men. That's how they did it. Now, I don't quite understand why, because the truth is, you are not Jewish by virtue of your dad. <laughs> You're Jewish by virtue of your mom. You know, unless you convert, but by virtue of your mother. Now, I don't understand. If you're Jewish by virtue of your mother, why did they trace the genealogy through the patriarchal line? I don't quite get that, except it's just the way they did it. Although, I think I understand why you would be Jewish by virtue of your mother, because Seymour Povich hadn't been born yet. <laughs> Y'all didn't watch more or know about more poets. See, there was no genetic testing. <laughs> oh, as my father used to say, mama's baby, daddy's baby. Um, basically, <laughs> mama knows for sure. She's the witness who can testify. Uh, and so ancient folks understood that. They figured that out. Um, but for some reason, Matthew followed the classic way of doing a genealogy through the male line, which didn't make sense. But then if you look at the genealogy of Jesus, you find a woman named Tamar, a woman named Rahab, a woman named Ruth, and one named Bathsheba. They're not supposed to be there. But there they are, women, in the genealogy of Jesus. And then if you check who, are, who these sisters are, these are some interesting sisters. <laughs> I tell you, Phyllis Tribble, a uh, biblical scholar, wrote a fascinating, incredible book years ago called Text of Terror about women who, women who were cast down in this world and by, the, by mother wit got up. One of them was named Tamar. Despised and rejected. A woman abused, bereft, and abandoned. But by... <coughs> My grandma used to call Mother Wit. Figured out how to survive, and not just survive, how to thrive in a man's world. And that's just the Tamar, is an ancestress of Jesus. Well, Matthew's trying to tell us something. Now, this ain't just about a man's world now. But, but, but then, then go on, just keep going. Keep going go to, to, to uh, Ruth, uh, Ruth and Naomi, y'all know that story of Ruth and Naomi? Whither thou goest, thou will go. Your people will be my people. Uh, two people suddenly adopting people who are not their own blood kin. You see what's going on here? And, 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 and they get together and, and they figure out the best way for Ruth to survive. The older woman, Naomi, said, I'm going to get your husband. And then you're going to be hooked up. 
<laughs> and there was this dude named Boaz, and before Boaz knew what hit him, he had a wife, and he and Ruth were ancestors, I think grandparents, of King David. And then there is Rahab. Now y'all know Rahab from the book of Joshua? Remember Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. Joshua fought the battle of Jericho and the walls came tumbling down. Well, at the battle of Jericho, before it fought it, Joshua sent um, his armies, he sent a reconnaissance team into the city of Jericho to, to spy out to find the strong places and the weak places. And basically, um, he knew he had to do this. This is standard military procedure. Uh, and he gave them detailed instructions about where to go, where not to go. And then, then he just says, and when y'all finish searching out the city, just go on to Rahab's house. He had to give them any instructions on how to get to Rahab's house. See, Rahab was a businesswoman. Let me tell you this another way. Y'all ever watch Gunsmoke? <laughs> you ever ask yourself, what did this kitty do for a living? <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. Rahab was the Miss Kitty of the bar, okay? I used to watch Gunsmoke with my grandma, and I, I think, I wonder, did grandma really know what Miss Kitty did for a living? And that's who Rahab was. And, and this Rahab saved the armies of Israel. And she was venerated as a heroine of Israel and remembered and is placed in the ancestral chart of Jesus of Nazareth. Now I say all of that because these are four remarkable women who learned and figured out how to not just survive, but how to thrive. And, but more than that, more than the fact that they were women, none of them were Jewish. None of them. They were all Gentiles. Canaanites, to be precise. In the genealogy of Jesus, Matthew's trying to tell us something. I want to suggest that that was the thesis that Matthew was working, that in the teachings and the way and the spirit of this Jesus of Nazareth, God is showing us how to move beyond simply being individual collection of self-interest. My tribe, my political party, my way of thinking, my church, my religion, my country, more than just the human race. He was showing become the human family of God. This tribalism will destroy us all. We are God's human family. We are to be a beloved community. And in that is our hope and salvation. There's another story, and with this I'll stop with the Bible story, but there's another story in Matthew's Gospel. In the 25th chapter of Matthew, some of y'all know it, it's the story, the parable of the last judgment. And the Bible talks about judgment day. What that's really getting at is what does God's justice look like? In other words, what does it look to set things right? What, what, what does God really care about? And, and so in the parable, and again, this is Jesus making up this story to teach, right? That's what the parable is. Well, in the parable, Jesus says, you know, on judgment day, the king will come in all of his glory. All of the nations will be arrayed before him, Republicans and Democrats. All of the nations. North Carolina General Assembly and NAACP. All right? Everybody, all God's children, have arrayed together before the King on Judgment Day. And he will say to the righteous ones, the ones whose lives reflect the justice and the rightness that God wants so passionately for his world, to them he will say, Come, enter the fullness of the kingdom prepared for you before the foundations of the earth. For I was hungry and you fed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was alone and in prison and you visited me. I was sick and you cared for me. And you can see, I can almost see the righteous ones running off ecstatic and, and then overjoyed. I mean, really excited. Maybe not the Episcopalians excited, but excited. Right? And, and, and I'll sing that hymn when, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be when we all sing Jesus. We'll sing and shout the victory. You can sing them just excited and going off to heaven. And one of them stopped and said, Wait a minute. Lord, don't misunderstand me. I, I want to go to heaven, but I don't remember seeing you hungry, much less feeding you or naked and clothing you. I don't remember that. And then Jesus says in the parable that the Lord responds, whenever you did it to these who are least members 
members of my family, you have done it unto me. The ethic of Jesus of Nazareth, the bottom line of Christianity that he got from Judaism, that, Judaism, that Islam has picked up, and that if you look deep enough in all of the authentic religions of the world, is that we were put here to be the family of God and to care for each other as the beloved community. And when we don't do that, we are dysfunctional. When I went off to college, I had a conversation with my, my daddy. We were in the car. And this was a long time, um, David. And David is a lot older than he looks. <laughs> It was a long time ago, and I was in the car with my dad, and I don't even know where we were going, and we were having a father-son conversation. He was having a conversation. I was rolling my eyes, probably. And he said, I want you to remember one thing when you go off to school. And I'm thinking the part was that. I want you to treat every girl the way you want somebody else to treat your sister. And I remember sitting there thinking, you have just ruined four years. <laughs> In one fell swoop, he just wiped out my whole academic career. Four years, out of all the fun I had planned, everything I had planned to do away from him and grandma. I mean, wiped out one minute, but I knew what he was talking Because he used to say when we were growing up, teach us to treat every girl the way you want somebody else to treat your own sister. Treat every boy the way you want to treat somebody to treat your own brother. Treat that girl like your sister because she is your sister. Treat that boy like your brother because he is your brother. Treat every woman like she's your mother because she is your mother. Every man like your father because he is. Treat them as members of your own family. Treat them like your blood kin. Show them the honor, the dignity, the respect, and then be a person who builds a society where every man, woman, and child is treated as a child of God and as brothers and sisters. Then work for social legislation that makes sure every child has an opportunity for an adequate and able education. Then build education to make sure everybody has health care and health insurance. Then build a society where all of God's children, no matter who they are, black, white, red, yellow, brown, gay, straight, that all of God's children, Republicans and Democrats, are treated as human beings, as God's children, as God's family. General Assembly of North Carolina, as you write your bills, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Yes. Yes. The truth is, this is a game changer. As long as we function on the level of the human race, then the survival of the fittest, no, then Ayn Rand is right. Okay. If we function on the level of the human race, then it is just biological survival. And the get while the get is good. But if we are the beloved community, the human family of God, and that's a game changer. A few years ago, I was listening to public radio, and there was an interview with a photographer named Norman Gershom, who I had never heard of before, um, who had just published a documentary film called God's House. It was a photographic essay of the Muslims of Albania um, during and after the Second World War. While Europe was descending into a profound nightmare with the rise of the Third Reich, and Jews were being rounded up and slaughtered. As the Nazis approached each country, the foreign ministries of that country were summoned and ordered to turn over the names and addresses of Jewish citizens of the nation. As the Nazi armies approached Albania, messages were sent to the foreign minister of Albania 
to prepare the names and addresses of all Jews living in Albania. The foreign minister was a Muslim. He didn't respond. And he quietly, like Harriet Tubman, organized an underground network in the Muslim community. And these were the words that he sent out secretly to the underground network. The Jewish people are our people. They shall live in your homes. They shall sleep in your beds. They shall eat at your tables. They shall find safety. The Jewish people are to be to us as our family. Muslim community of Albania saved over 2,000 Jews from the Nazis. My friends, this is a game changer. To become not simply the human race, but the human family of God. And that changes all our politics. It changes all our relations. truth is, and with this I will sit down. I, I, well, you know the definition of an optimist? When a preacher says, and in conclusion. <laughs> <laughs> That's not just metaphor. Huh? <laughs> the truth is, I believe we were created to be God's human. And when we are not, we are dysfunctional. And that dysfunction is actually an aberration. We were made to be family. Some years ago, back in, actually this is back in the 1980s, I was serving a uh, church in Lincoln Heights, Ohio, uh, just north of Cincinnati. And uh, the, we lived in the parsonage or man, so rectory right next door to the church. And my wife and I were younger then, we could do that then. But anyway, right next door to the church. And actually, I didn't have to go outside to get to the church. It was a walkway, covered walkway, just walked in and could get into the church. And um, so one day I came home for lunch, to eat lunch, and um, the mail had come, and there was a letter. And it got my attention because it was a computer-generated letter. And this is like after 1982-ish, somewhere thereabouts. And, you know, computer-generated letters, that was a relatively new thing. And it was the old dot matrix. Remember that? Um, yes. Anyway, so I opened the letter to kind of see what this was from. And it was from this company. Um, and it began, Dear Mr. Michael B. Curry, we have researched your genealogy um, and your family ancestry. And we have located your ancestral home, and if you send us your Visa, American Express, and MasterCard number, we will send you a copy of your family crest and um, put you in touch with your family in Ireland. <laughs> so, I, yeah, that's what I did too. I just kind of, I said, well, yeah, that's what, that's what I ought to do, just kind of going over to Ireland and say, guess who's coming to dinner? <laughs> So anyway, I didn't, I didn't give it any credence or pay any more attention to it. Uh, but then some years later, um, actually June 26, 2007, to be precise, I was, actually, I was reading the New York Times, and there was an article on, that began with these words. It was on recent genetic research. Uh, DNA studies now point to a common maternal ancestor of all anatomically upright human beings. I may go to Ireland and see the family. <laughs> and, 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 and if that's not enough, um, the New England Genealogical Society, about a, uh, a little bit that same year, but a little bit later in the year, um, did genealogical research on the candidates, Republican and Democrat, who were running for President of the United States. And now, the New England Genealogical Society is a real, I mean, that's a real, that's the real deal. I mean, this is a reputable, this is not what the National Enquirer or Star Magazine or something. I mean, this is, this is the real deal. Uh, but anyway, they had done research, genealogical research on the candidates, and they had um, discovered that Barack Obama, 
Brad Pitt and Laura Bush are actually cousins. <laughs> Their research continued and they discovered that then Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton and Senator John McCain are actually cousins. <laughs> but I think the most significant finding was that, you remember, you remember uh, Strong Thurman, Senator Strong Thurman? <laughs> the New England Genealogical Society discovered from their research now that the late Senator Strom Thurmond and the Reverend Al Sharpton are cousins. <laughs> My brothers and sisters, we really are family. That is who we are. And maybe it's said best by Desmond Tutu, who wrote and I quote, I have a dream, God says. Help me to realize it. It is a dream of a world whose ugliness and squalor and poverty, whose war and hostility, greed and harsh competitiveness, alienation and disharmony are changed into their glorious counterparts when there will be laughter and joy and peace, where there will be justice and goodness and compassion and love and care and sharing. I have dreamed that swords will be beaten into plowshares and spears into pruning hooks that my children will know that they are members of one family, the human family, God's family, my family. <clears throat> and in God's family, there are no outsiders. All are insiders, black and white, rich and poor, gay and straight, Jew and Arab, Palestinian and Israeli, Catholic and Protestant, Serbian and Albanian, Tutsi and Hutu, Muslim and Christian, Buddhist and Hindu, Pakistani, Indian, 